Hello, and welcome to the webinar entitled Euthanasia and St. Joseph, the Catholic response during COVID-19. My name is Matthew Vallis, and I'm a seminarian representing the Pro-Life Committee at St. John's Seminary. To begin, I now ask Father Ed Re Edward Riley, St. John's Seminary Dean of Men, to offer a prayer on our behalf. Father Ed? Yes, and welcome again on behalf of our rector, Father Salak. It's a privilege to welcome all of you to this presentation because we know it will be not only a timely one, but a very informative one on the issue of euthanasia and the response to the great St. Joseph. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious gift of life itself. We thank you for reminding us every day that every life is precious from the moment of conception to natural death. You teach us through the word made flesh, your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that the dignity of every person flows from you and that every life, regardless of well-being, of health, of mind or body, remains in your image and likeness. May you bless our evening tonight and for all those who gather with us through this online means for the deeper reverence for life and understanding of the tragedy that euthanasia is and for the conversion of all hearts, our hearts, and all those that remain in some darkness about the beauty, the truth, the goodness of you, our God, as creator of all. We ask that through the gift of the intercessions of the ever-Virgin Mary and the great Saint Joseph, that your son may open our hearts and minds to praise and worship you, the one true God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Ed. In a few moments, I will introduce to you Dr. Janet Benestad, our main speaker for this evening. Before I do that, I would like to direct your attention to the bottom of your Zoom screen, where you should see a Q&A tab. Please click the Q&A tab. If during the talk you have a question, you may type your question into the box. If you wish to send in your question anonymously, then please click the Send Anonymously box before you click Send. At the end of her talk, Professor Benestad will answer your questions. Now to introduce our speaker, I begin by noting that Dr. Janet Benestad is a member of the philosophy faculty at St. John's Seminary, where she teaches courses in philosophy, catechism, and writing. From 2009 to 2015, Mrs. Benestad served on the staff of His Eminence, Cardinal Sean O'Malley as Secretary for Faith Formation and Evangelization in the Archdiocese of Boston. In 2012, she led an Archdiocesan Education Initiative on Physician-Assisted Suicide, part of a year-long campaign in which assisted suicide was defeated in Massachusetts. She also led an initiative during Lent 2011 to invite non-practicing Catholics to return to the faith. Mrs. Benestad currently resides with her husband in Falmouth, Massachusetts. They are the parents of four children and the grandparents of five. Dr. Benestad, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Matthew. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm so delighted to be here this evening and thank you to the Pro-Life Committee for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of this. This is such important work as Father Ed has, has uh, so graciously uh, 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 prayed for for the success of this. Um, I did, as as Matthew said, had the opportunity to serve on the staff of the Archbishop, and I was there in 2012 when the Death with Dignity Act was put on the ballot in Massachusetts. So I'll begin with a few words about that campaign. I, of course, did not really lead that campaign. It was the Cardinal who led the campaign, but I had the the privilege of helping him. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that campaign to show you how close we came to legalizing assisted suicide and how difficult it was to do that. And then we'll talk about current attitudes toward death and dying and the great St. Joseph. Uh, in 2012, there were only two states in the United States that allowed assisted suicide, Oregon and the state of Washington, both in the Pacific Northwest. For more than 20 years, pro-suicide groups had tried to get assisted suicide legalized in um, uh, more than 20 states in the United States, but to no avail. In 2012, something had changed. And what had changed was what had gone on in the state of Washington. 
Legalization in the state of Washington in 2008 was the result of a wildly popular candidate on the Democratic ticket, Barack Obama, of course, and a very liberal statewide majority. In 2012, assisted suicide groups from Oregon and Washington tried to duplicate that reality in Massachusetts with President Obama on the ticket again, despite Massachusetts being 46% Catholic at the time, more than 60% of voters said that uh, when they were polled that they would vote for assisted suicide. So the hope was that the Death with Dignity Act would be a sure win in 2012. The law was a very bad law. It required two physicians to certify that the patient was competent. There was no psychiatric exam. Two witnesses to the patient's competence were needed, but one witness could be an heir to the patient's estate. There was no family re notification required. And after three requests, two written and one oral, the patient was dispensed a prescription for a vial of pills, asked to take the pills home, large orange pills, open them, dump the contents of the 90 pills into orange juice or applesauce, consume the mixture and die. No medical personnel could be present at the death. And when the patient died, the death certificate would say that the patient died of the terminal illness. This, according to the Death with Dignity Act, was a humane and dignified death. Now a ballot initiative is like running a candidate for office. Anything over 50% wins. In Massachusetts, the Catholic bishops were the only real opponents of assisted suicide, except for disabilities groups who had traditionally always opposed assisted suicide. Because when one starts talking about quality of life, the, 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 the disabilities groups are well aware that uh, that can be translated into a description of their lives. And they, they are the ones being dis described many times. The bishops knew that they were the real opponents and also knew that they could not be the leaders on this campaign. They hired a Boston-based firm with a 100% record of winning ballot initiatives. The consultants mounted and managed a public web-based campaign called stopasuicide.org that cost close to $5 million. Three strategies were used during this campaign. First, consultants formed a broad-based coalition, religious groups, medical organizations, disabilities groups, particularly hospice workers, pharmacists, all opposed to assisted suicide for different reasons, worked together to leverage their own constituencies to vote no. The second strategy used targeted polling to identify what are called flaws, F-L-A-W-S, in the bill, deficiencies in the bill, that the law required that the prescription be picked up at a local pharmacy, that the patient need not consult his family, that no medical personnel could be present, and, that, and, and also that the patient need not consult his family. These were identified by voters in polling conversations. About 3,000 people were polled to do this. And they were identified by voters, even voters sympathetic to assisted suicide on grounds of compassion or some, some other concern as um, things that would cause them to vote no, to vote against the bill. These flaws became the focus of an intense media campaign in September and October of 2012. The video you are about to see, entitled Pharmacist, was identified by the New York Times only a few days after the election as the cause of the defeat of assisted suicide in Massachusetts. So here's the video, Pharmacist. As a pharmacist, my job is to help people get better from their illnesses. But if question two passes, physician-assisted suicide will be legal in Massachusetts, and I'll be doing just the opposite. Local pharmacies like mine could fill prescriptions for a powerful narcotic called Secanol, which people will use to commit suicide at home. No doctors, no hospitals, just a hundred of these. And they call that death with dignity? Vote no on question two. It's out of control. 
hard hitting. Not all of the ads were as hard hitting, but that was the one that was blamed for the defeat of assisted suicide. The third strategy was to, de to defeat the, the bill by splitting the liberal vote, the 60% that I mentioned before that polled in favor of assisted suicide. And the way to do that was by splitting the black vote in the city of Boston. 2.7 million people voted for or against assisted suicide in 2012. And it was defeated by 51.1% to 48.9%, a margin of less, of fewer than 1.5 uh, percent of votes. That's about 60,000 votes. The city of Boston has 22 wards. 12 of the 22 wards voted against assisted suicide. Leading the way among the 12 were Dorchester, Roxbury, and Hyde Park, traditionally black liberal constituencies, democratic strongholds in the city of Boston. Credit for that goes to the black pastors who got the information about the bill into the parishes. And by doing that, provided the 1% that we needed to win. Yes, votes for assisted suicide, the other side, came predominantly from white affluent suburbs that ring the city of Boston. Regarding specifically Catholic efforts in the campaign, uh, which was the, the part of the campaign that I had the most to do with, assisted suicide was defeated territorially in three of the four dioceses in Massachusetts. A devastating tornado only a year prior to 2012 had made it difficult to do campaign efforts in, in Springfield. Nonetheless, even though the vote in Springfield was pro-assisted suicide, it was by less than 1%. Boston, Worcester, Fall River, and Springfield Diocese combined to distribute more than 2 million pieces of literature. Thousands of yard signs, business signs, door knockers, polling signs, videos in three languages, published hundreds of newspapers in the Catholic press, and uh, folks like myself gave hundreds of speeches in the parishes and Catholic institutions during 2012. The message of that campaign was suicide is always a tragedy, taken from the USCC document on assisted suicide published just before, the year before, assisted suicide showed up in Massachusetts. That campaign combined with the coalition, the strategic polling, and the message, messaging about the flaws saved Massachusetts from legalized assisted suicide in 2012. Since then, assisted suicide has been legalized in Hawaii, Colorado, California, Maine, Vermont, New Jersey, and Washington, DC. And it's also legal in Montana by court order. Added to Oregon and Washington, that's 10 states with legalized assisted suicide, 20% of the United States in 13 years. What does all this have to do with uh, St. Joseph? Well, I'd like to use a book, a new book uh, by Dr. Lydia Dugdale, The Lost Art of Dying, Reviving Forgotten Wisdom. Dr. Dugdale is an internist at Columbia Presbyterian in New York, in New York and also at Yale New Haven Hospital in Connecticut. And she documents the fact that people don't die especially well anymore. We worry about being a burden. We worry about quality of life and about control. We try to prolong life, she says, beyond reasonable expectations and medicalize death. Dr. Dugdale tells the story of a man that she says she met when he was dead three times. Despite his weak heart and frailty, uh, she describes when they resuscitated him, the sound of his, of his ribs cracking was like sticks that you break to light a fire. That's how frail he was. He was brought back to life three times in one night, only to code again. We do these things, says Dr. Dugdale, because we're, uh, we're not familiar with death. People don't die at home. They die in hospitals and they die in nursing homes, as we've, we've learned uh, in the past year. If we weren't conscious of that, we are now. Dr. Dugdale talks about the Ars Moriendi. Now the Ars Moriendi is a little known handbook developed in the 15th century in response to the 10 year bubonic plague, which took the lives of two thirds of the population of Europe. 
horror stories about the outbreak, the terrible spread, particularly in Florence, the bulbous sores that uh, yielded infection and spread it so rapidly. The fact that one could hardly escape the death caused people to ask for an, an instruction on how to deal with this, these ghastly deaths. Focusing on Jewish and Western Christian traditions, the Ars Moriendi presented a spiritualized view of death. Christ is portrayed as at the head of the bed, along with God the Father, uh, in order to, uh, to encourage those to understand that God is always with those who suffer. At the foot of the bed were the martyrs, particularly those who had suffered terrible deaths. St. Stephen, St. Barbara, who was decapitated by her father, St. Catherine and St. Lawrence, who were tortured. The Ars Moriendi encouraged the dying and also the living to develop a sense of finitude about life. Published in 1415, the Ars Moriendi was available. It was in circulation until the 1900s. What happened? Well, World War I with an enormous number of deaths. And then uh, of course, uh, the prosperity that followed World War II and the, uh, the, the beginning of modernized hospitalizations uh, the fact that, that hospitals had better surgical procedures as a result of the war, chemotherapies, antibiotics, all contributed to a sense that, uh, that, that, that uh, long life was, uh, was in the offing for most people. Nobody wanted to hear after World War II and, and, and six, six years of war and plague, and plague that preceded it at the beginning of the 20th century, Spanish flu, nobody wanted to hear about death. Dr. Dugdale in her book suggests that we revive the Ars Moriendi, at least from the perspective of talking about the finitude of life. She reflects on things like recovering a sense of that finitude about our lives, recovering a sense of community and guarding against the excessive allure of hospitals as a destination, recognizing that fears about death cannot be medicalized, they're spiritual. Dr. Dugdale tells the story of a ghastly modern failure of community. An elderly Japanese man living in his apartment was found dead after three years. His bills were paid from an electronic account. He was only found when the account ran out of money. St. Francis de Sales conceives the death of St. Joseph in these words, St. Joseph, who had loved so much in his life, could not die but of love. In a homily on the feast of St. Joseph, St. John Paul II talks about St. Joseph's holiness. The Pope's emphasis uh, on Joseph's role as father is appropriate to the fact that the homily is given at the elevation of nine bishops. In the words of Mary to Jesus in the temple, Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. Jesus replies, do you not know that I must be in my father's house? These words capture the mystery of Joseph's fatherhood. Joseph, truly Mary's husband, and Jesus's father, led a spousal paternal life, totally subordinate to God's plan, not his own. In this, the Pope recommends St. Joseph to the bishops and priests to whom he's, he's speaking at the homily as fathers and guardians of flock. In Redemptoris Custos, John Paul's apostolic exhortation on St. Joseph, the Pope reflects on another quality of the great saint, his silence. He took Mary as his wife, although he knew her not. He loved and protected her, though she belonged exclusively to God. He shared in her eminent dignity, whereby she towers above all creatures. And all of this he does in an aura of silence without saying a word. He put his whole liberty at the disposal of the divine will. And in return, he was among the first beneficiaries of Jesus's personal love. What a witness in this age of personal autonomy and quality of life arguments. During this year of St. Joseph, 
it's fitting that we reflect upon helping people to die well, so that they helping people to die well it, 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 uh, by helping them to live well. During the campaign to defeat assisted suicide, Miles Sheehan, who is a priest and a medical doctor, was asked, what will you do when you're asked to go to the bedside and anoint someone who will ask for, us for lethal drugs, who is intending to take lethal drugs? Father Sheehan's answer, go and talk them out of it. And I encourage priests and seminarians to prepare yourselves to go and talk them out of it because it is very possible that you will be serving in a place where assisted suicide is legal. The issue is so pressing that just this July, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued Samaritanus bonus, an instruction that responds directly to the growing threat to the faith of the people from assisted suicide and euthanasia. The document repeats the teaching of the church that Assisted suicide and euthanasia are intrinsically evil, violations of God's law. And it stresses that assisted suicide particularly adds to the gravity of suicide by implicating others in the, in the temptation to despair. It cautions against the use of medical and physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, which are legal in Massachusetts. They were legalized in 2013 after assisted suicide was defeated. By signing these orders, patients may give permission to withdraw food and water with a view toward bringing about death. Father Ryan Connors is with us this evening, and in a moment, I'll invite him to say a word about anointing, particularly regard to one of its principal effects, to strengthen the dying against the temptation to despair. To priests and seminarians, I would say preach, in season and out of season, on the sanctity of life, of the unborn surely, of the elderly, of the terminally ill, but also on preparing oneself to take one's leave at the appointed hour. Encourage the training of pastoral visitors and, and um, um, parish nurses, whose work it is to visit the sick and the elderly in parishes visit the sick and the dying as often as possible. I always tell my students, Itaya Joseph, when they have a mortal concern or a grave, grave uh, danger that, 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 uh, is, is, that might befall. And why is that? Because it's Joseph who is the saint of the living, precisely because he is the saint of the dying. It's Joseph who's the foster father of Jesus who can refuse him no request. The terror of demons, the conqueror of hell is Joseph, whose own death was undoubtedly a beautiful one, dying as we all wish in the arms of Jesus and Mary. Thank you. I'd like to introduce now Father Ryan Connors. He's a moral theologian and uh, professor at St. John's Seminary. Father Ryan was among the first priests to go into hospitals last spring to anoint the dying. My pleasure, Father Ryan. Uh, thank you, Professor Benestat. And let me uh, be the first to thank you for your excellent uh, presentation and also on behalf of the Catholic people for your uh, work on this successful campaign to promote the culture of life, the gospel of life in Massachusetts. So thank you for all of your work uh, for many years on that. Uh, I'd just like to make a brief uh, comment tonight. I think as one sign of hope or one sign of a solution or the beginnings of a solution to this challenging question is to say something about the church's sacramental life and the sacrament of the anointing of the sick that can be uh, and is intended to be a great help to people who find themselves in these challenging and difficult situations. One, it's a complicated and long history of how we find ourselves in this situation of people being tempted to physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. But one issue, in my view, is a, a general lack of the sense of the grace of the sacrament of holy anointing, which is available to the sick, the seriously sick and dying. 
that the sacrament of the anointing of the sick was instituted by our Lord precisely to assist those who are seriously ill and dying, especially to resist the various temptations which often accompany serious illness and dying, namely a temptation to doubt and to despair and to inconstancy and impatience and lack of perseverance and all of those afflictions which affect what theologians and philosophers call the irascible appetite, that part of our soul which when something is difficult, when there is some arduous good before us that we suffer, that the Lord has instituted the sacrament of the anointing of the sick precisely to strengthen sick and dying Christians in this moment. And that's why it's such an important piece, as it were, of this um, puzzle, of this challenge when people face grave suffering and sickness and the prospect of death. And so it's why it's a great priority of the church to ensure that the sick and dying have access to the sacraments. And so that's why it was such a grave uh, difficulty and tragedy when at the beginning of the pandemic last spring, last March, when it was very difficult, people were in hospitals and various places in which it was difficult for priests to get to them, to give them the sacraments. And so uh, Cardinal Sean deserves merits great credit and great praise for organizing teams of priests who would ensure that no Catholic in this part of the country would die without the sacraments. And while it was a difficult, even political uh, process to ensure that hospitals and civil officials would permit priests into the hospitals, the Cardinal deserves enormous credit for uh, insisting upon the right of Christians who are sick and dying to receive the sacraments precisely uh, so that they might have access to the graces that the sacraments offer. So I just offer that as one uh, possible help, one possible solution to, for priests and seminarians and the Catholic people to recover the great gift of holy anointing as a help to guard against the temptations that sick and dying persons uh, may suffer. I too am happy to take your questions. Thank you, Father Ryan, and thank you, Professor Benestad, for, for your, your talk and, um, and just for the, the way you present it. It's really, it's really very wonderful to take in as a seminarian, as, as a man studying for the priesthood. I have a question uh, that's um, based on being a friend or a family member, seeing someone else uh, struggle with the thought of maybe I should, um, I, should, I should take a little bit more morphine or um, do something that would precipitate my my cause of death maybe more quickly than than before and and with with euthanasia possibly being legalized in the future um, it, it seems more likely that these kinds of issues will, will come up so I, I it's it's kind of a question for all three panelists um, I'm, I'm hoping that it can be answered first father Ed then, then professor Benestad then, then father Ryan Connors what what kinds of principles should a friend or or a family member uh, consider in um, in in trying to have this kind of conversation to to encourage someone to to choose life, Father Ed. Sure. Uh, speaking from a pastoral uh, point of view, I would say the first thing to do is is to listen uh, very intently and and uh, in a way that very often when people are at that point of the stage of, of considering taking their life, what, whether it's a young person, whether it's an elderly person, sick, disabled, uh, their thought is either uh, errantly by their own thinking or by the influences of others, that their life no longer has any value, that their life isn't needed. Uh, we have fallen so much into a culture that says, you know, if your life doesn't have some meaningful purpose, and whoever determines that, I don't know, uh, that they very easily slip into doubt and fear. And therefore, like Father Ryan was speaking to, um, they really run the risk at the end of their life of making a decision that can obviously is, is lethal. So I would say the first thing from a pastoral perspective, and it doesn't necessarily have to be priest or and or seminarians, it can be family members, it could be close friends, it could be parishioners, um, be attentive to people who seem to be, you know, they were daily communicants and all of a sudden they haven't been coming to mass at all. 
you know, check in on them and to ensure that they have a sense of purpose in their life. The second thing I would do is uh, to be unafraid to really ask some questions. I think very often we forget that the older folks have so much to teach us. I, you know, can personally say I've learned more about my dad in some in elements of his life after his death, and that's primarily from my mother. But if you ask those questions beforehand, it gives a sense of purpose and meaning, uh, and you share or intergenerational and. A relationship. So you may be a grandchild, you may be a son or a daughter to the person who's in that situation, uh, but to try very much to, to take an interest in their life by asking them more questions about their life. And that, that deposits more joy into their soul. It gives them a chance to really feel that their life is not at this stage unproductive, but in fact, passing on, if you will, sort of the torch uh, of all their wisdom, of all their life experiences. And we're still within the lifetime of a generation that would probably be at this point, considering taking your life, who have lived so much more in their life circumstances than, than most of us who are, you know, say 50 or 60 and younger. I mean, remember this generation grew up without any of the conveniences that we have. So the hardships, the challenges, but they persevered. They were able to give so much to our country, to our nation, to wherever they live, um, that we have a lot of gratitude and I would say that's for me a third thing is just to express great gratitude to these persons for their lives, never to look at where they are today, but to remember their whole life circumstances. Um, as Sister, or Dr. Benedat was saying, we sometimes do have to learn how to, to learn how to appreciate dying, um, but we don't do it the way the world does it. We do it because I often like to say to the, even to the seminarians, the best is yet to come. Uh, a moral theologian just prior to Ryan, Father Ryan, always used to share with us as a priest, never give up the deathbed, never let it be you know, an ending without the priest being able to administer the sacraments, to pray, especially the Holy Rosary with them or the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and just to accompany them, um, but to show deep gratitude and deep respect and reverence for that person. And I would say that can have a great effect on nurses, doctors, uh, others who might be involved in the, the process of trying to help someone die or take somebody's life, those little moments of conversion come when they see someone taking the time by the bedside of the dying, it starts to trigger within them a, a process of appreciation and understanding that this is a human being, that this is a life that's been lived well. Um, and so they too may start to change their own attitude, their own approach to being able to assist others, even at what point they're going to die. So with that, maybe I'll just turn it over to, again, Dr. Benestad, maybe Father Ryan. Um, Dr. Benestad, if it's okay, actually, I, I noticed, I really appreciate your answer, Father Ed. I, I noticed uh, as, as you were talking, some people had some other questions come up. The first question was for me, so I'd like to, um, I'd like to transition to asking some of the questions on behalf of the people. But thank you so much, Father Ed. I, 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 I will take this to heart, and I think brothers and, and, and other people who are, who are tuning in will, will take what you say to heart and, and apply it to to the situations that present themselves in the future. For Dr. Benestad, um, well, or, or for, for Father Ryan Connors, um, would either of you kindly speak about the notion that many have that assisted suicide actually allows their loved ones to die with dignity? As you mentioned, suffering and death is often misunderstood and feared, and many think they are being helpful by condoning assisted suicide. Uh, yes, that's often the case. Um, of people, people mistake assisted suicide out of compassion. One of the reasons that 60% of people in Massachusetts believed that assisted suicide was good was out of compassion. Who am I to interfere in someone's decision to take their own lives? Um, rather than looking at it as, as from the dignity perspective the Father Ed just, just spoke of so, so beautifully. Um, and, and we, we need, this is, this is one of the reasons why it was essential to run a political campaign, to build a coalition, to try to bring as many on board for as many reasons as possible. But it is not a reason to forego the argument that assisted suicide is an evil. And as the recent document from the CDF says, it is a very serious evil because it implicates others in our own temptation to despair. Assisted suicide is the taking of a life. It is not compassion. It is never compassion. Suicide is never a tragedy. Um, and even when we prescind from the discussion 
of the, the morality of assisted suicide. Let it never be, be thought that it is a lesser evil than euthanasia. In fact, in the countries where assisted suicide is legal, it almost always degenerates into euthanasia. In other words, voluntary euthanasia, which is assisted suicide, asking for suicide almost always turns into euthanasia, which is imposed on others with, against their will. Um, many people think that it's less serious because the patient asks for it. The fact is that is not true. Thank you, Dr. Benestead. Another question. Can you address the role of palliative care at the end of life and how to proceed when the unintended consequence of relieving pain may be death? Um, I, can, I can address that I, and I'll address it from Dr. Dugdale's book. Very interestingly, Mass General Hospital did a study about palliative care. And um, what they did is they had two groups. They had some who received standard care for a very serious lung cancer and some who received palliative care from the very beginning of their treatment. Uh, and the prognosis for this particular lung cancer was less than a year to live. The fact is that those who received palliative care, which often, often uh, involves receiving um, less chemotherapy, uh, less of the more, more uh, ex extraordinary things that we do in order to, uh, to cure, there was not going to be a cure, but to relieve the symptoms. Uh, those who received less of that and palliative care, which is a combination of chemotherapies and standard medical care, plus spiritual care and holistic care, um, and particularly living life to the fullest while one is being treated, that those people live two months longer than they would have lived otherwise, and then those who received the standard treatment. Um, palliative care has a reputation for actually expanding the possibilities for those who have a very serious or terminal illness. So um, I, I, that's, that's what I would say about, about palliative care. I think that's very interesting. I just discovered that uh, when I read Dr. Dugdale's book, I didn't know about that study. Thank you, Dr. Benestad. As a nurse, pain management will be the most common concern. Any ideas of what can be offered, especially if not Catholic, and they don't, uh, they don't have a desire to receive the sacraments? Nurses are, are wonderful when it comes to the care of the sick, especially the terminally ill. Those who've had any kind of serious illness will tell you. Um, they're very grateful for what the doctor does in terms of surgery, et cetera but very often it's the nursing care that gets them through. Um, I know nurses uh, who talk about, especially hospice nurses, and that is, that is what I would recommend with regard to, to this question. Nurses who literally hold patients in their arms and console them, counsel them, help them with the temptations to despair, to want to, want to get it over with, which is a, another of the temptations at the end. Um, nursing care is very, very important in this regard. And this is where hospice, hospice comes in. And I think also where Dale's recommendations to medicalize death. Don't, don't hospital the destination. She says a hospital, people have acute illness that can be removed. For those who are dying, they often home this place with uh, hospice uh, procedures, benefits. Patients do well, we all find that they feel better in the situations. That's what I would recommend. I'm a nurse, so I, I can't say it more. I don't, uh, I wouldn't be able to. I can add something briefly to that. Uh, I would just uh, commend nurses and those who are with people who are dying. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, task that they are entrusted with and they have difficult kind of decisions to make. Uh, people can and should be given medication to alleviate pain. They should not be given it to such a degree uh, that it kills them, but it may be the case that a, a side effect as it were of some pain relief is as the catechism says, the shortening of the person's days uh, and that is a legitimate moral act. It's treated in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, myself, I do not counsel people um, 
to be overly scrupulous. They, they have to, there's a very difficult decisions that people make. And uh, there is a difference between treating someone and an effect of that treatment, which may uh, even hasten their death and deciding to set out to euthanize someone. It should be said that insofar as possible, people should be kept conscious so that they can receive the sacraments, so that they can make restitution for raw, any wrongdoing. They can have conversations with their family. They can pray. Uh, so some pain uh, basically is worth it to have that. Finally, just lastly, often in these uh, discussions, we distinguish between the ordinary care due to every person which in principle includes food and water, so long as it can be assimilated. Uh, and we distinguish that from extraordinary medical interventions. It should be noted that those awaiting to receive the sacraments of the church, those who are candidates to receive the anointing of the sick, everything should be done to kept them, keep them alive until they receive the sacraments. Everything is ordinary care in that case. Thank you, Father Ryan. Um, I, I, I'm, re I'm, really, uh, I'm really happy to see so many questions have come up. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all of them in this webinar. My hope is that when, I send, when we send out a survey after this event, we'll have a space where if, you're, if you didn't get your question answered um, in the Q&A, we could arrange so that it could get answered. Okay, so I, I just, I just want to let everyone here know that but um but yes when you receive the survey please fill it out to let us know how we can improve on on webinars such as this one to close out the evening i now ask father ed to offer a prayer on our behalf and to give us his blessing father ed thank you matthew and, and again to a sincere thank you to dr benestad for a wonderful presentation and just bringing again to our awareness and attention the needs of our sisters and brothers whatever circumstance they find themselves into and so again on behalf of the uh, father salix our rector I, I want to thank you and all those who are participating through online so let us pray in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen dear heavenly father we thank you for the gift of your daughter janet benestad and the gift that she and so many others give to us in their service to proclaim and def defend the dignity of the sick, the dying, the disabled, the vulnerable populations of our sisters and brothers, to the powerful intercessions of the greatest saint, St. Joseph, the earthly father of your own beloved son. May we be more intentional and ardent in the care and the defense of the dignity of every human life, as we do all these things, we do them through the intercessions of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we ask this now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Ed. And thank you all again for attending. Stay tuned for more events. Good night, and God bless.